Hi everybody, thank you uh, for coming or listening in today. Let's get this started. So in Eastern North America we have two main regions where genetic divergence within a number of taxa seems to structure in predictable ways. The first one in the central eastern United States is at the Mississippi River embayment on the eastern and western sides of the river itself. And the second, about 400 miles south of where we are today in Raleigh, North Carolina, is Peninsular Florida, where taxa in Peninsular Florida are deeply divergent from those in the rest of the continental United States. So we determine these patterns uh, through phylogeography, which is at its core mapping the spatial distribution of alleles. So these maps are then used to come up with biogeographic hypotheses that can be tested. So the first barrier I want to talk a little bit about is the Mississippi River embayment. In a number of species, pooled above here on the left, we see a very distinct pattern with a deeply divergent clade on either side of the Mississippi River embayment. So we see this in snakes in particular over a wide variety of different ecologies. Interestingly, even some water snake species show divergence at the river. The Mississippi River varied greatly in volume and changed course frequently during the Pleistocene and remains a, a pretty formidable biogeographic feature today. So likely limiting gene flow, um, particularly in the in the southern region where uh, where it's very wide. So <clears throat> this vicariance of the river itself is usually invoked in explaining this deep divergence that we see between the two sides. Uh, but it's it's possible that there are a number of different causes that have provided pseudo congruent patterns, which are patterns that appear similar at first but differ in key characteristics such as uh, fine scale location, timing of divergence, or, or, or mode of divergence. The second region we have uh, here is the southeastern United States, particularly at the Florida Peninsula. So the current Florida shoreline is, is outlined here on the right uh, in white. Um, so you can see this super uh, super interesting complex region, which despite being the birthplace of phylogeography, uh, is still very vastly understudied. So this region is home to exceptionally high reptile diversity, um, not so much lizards, but especially in snakes and turtles. We see a large amount of cryptic diversity with a number of species on the peninsula itself being deeply divergent from those on the continent proper, sometimes with divergence dating estimates as high as over 6 million years old. So this has typically been explained by vicariance caused by sea level change. Uh, the majority of the peninsula is very low in elevation. When you raise sea level by as little as 30 meters, like in this depiction you see here, um, you get almost complete inundation of the peninsula, and you're left with this, this island region in central Florida. So this has been referred to as the Orange Island Hypothesis, where you have isolation down on the island, subsequent speciation, and then expansion out of this location when sea level drops back down again. So again, with this area, there are a number of potential pseudo-congruent processes that may be at work. Um, these patterns we see may only appear similar as a result of a plurality of processes. So this leaves us with a number of questions about these barriers, right? So these can't be the only species that show this break. So we want to identify more species that show divergence in these regions. Um, we also want to test the nature of these barriers. So how strong are they really? Do we see gene flow occurring? Uh, and is this strict vicariance or, or is something else at work? And then we want to use that to figure out if there are alternative or revised hypotheses that we can test at these barriers. So at this point I want to introduce this organism, the yellow-bellied or, or prairie king snake, Lampropeltis caligaster. It's going to help us start to get at these questions because it has a somewhat wide distribution in the U.S., which crosses both of the regions that we just talked about. Um, three subspecies have been described, two of which were originally described as separate species. And also it's found in an interesting assortment of habitats, everything from dry and wet prairies to pine forests. So what we did to try and get at our questions uh, was use molecular methods to, to test this species. Um, so we extracted DNA from 59 individuals from across the range using Kyogen DNA Easy Kits. Uh, we sequenced five loci, four nuclear, and one mitochondrial. Um, we edited and aligned the data in Genius and phased our data using the Seek Phase website and, and Phase itself. We determined our best model of molecular evolution for each gene in J Model Test 2. We estimated individual gene trees in Beast. Then for species delimitation, we assigned individuals to populations without constraining them to species using Structurama. Uh, we created a species tree in StarBeast and uh, ran that analysis until all uh, effective sample size scores were a thousand or higher. 
we used, uh, and then we, then finally we used species delimitation methods in BPP to test the support for those nodes we generated. Once our species were delimited, we then used migrate to test competing models of migration between populations. So migrate tests uh, four models of migration. Migration from population A into population B, population B into population A, bilateral migration from A into B and B into A, or a model of uh, completely panmictic populations. We then modeled environmental niche using the world climb bioclimate variables and uh, used the niche identity and range break tests in ENM tools. Finally, we used the gap uh, land cover data from the USGS website to determine uh, the floristic communities in which each species was found. This data is really cool and it's produced, uh, it's produced through remote sensing and it's a resolution of about 30 meters. So if you haven't messed with it, I really urge you to check it out. There's an online viewer on the website. You don't even need ARC or anything fancy to access uh, it just to check it out. So what we found in our species limitation was three distinct species that correspond to currently recognized subspecies, which were based on original species descriptions. This is kind of neat, since this sort of clean-cut correspondence to morphology doesn't happen very often in the snake world. We elevated these taxa, uh, these three taxa, to Lampropeltis caligaster, Lampropeltis rhombomaculata, and Lampropeltis occipitolineata. All three have morphological differences in pattern and scale count, um, things like number of blotches down the back and, and scales around the mouth that, that uh, herpetologists call labial scales. So this is how the population is structured geographically. We have Lampropeltis caligaster in the west, Lampropeltis rhombomaculata in the east, that's in green, and Lampropeltis occipitolineata in south Florida, that's the purple one. So the two eastern lineages, rhombomaculata and occipitolineata, are sister to the tan western lineage caligaster. We find Pleistocene divergence times for these taxa, with the western species splitting from the two eastern around one and a half million years ago, and the South Florida species split from the eastern species about 875,000 years ago. We get highest model support for low levels of migration in each direction, similar to rates uh, found in other species of Lampropeltis in North America. And the most interesting thing to note here, and I uh, hope you notice this, is that the break is not exactly at the Mississippi River, but it's east of there, somewhere among the states of Mississippi and Alabama. So you recall we also tested niche for these species, right? And when we look at that, we find that each species is occupying its own distinct niche. In the west, that niche is corresponding to this, the western plains and prairie habitat. In the east, uh, these really cool eastern pine forests. And in south Florida, um, this somewhat rare prairie habitat. Uh, it's wet prairie habitat and, and bordering associated pasture lands with that habitat. So. These findings have a number of implications, right? The first being that the patterns we see at the Mississippi River may be due to divergence in the habitats on either side of the river, uh, rather than due to strict vicariance of the waterway itself. To my knowledge, this is the first time anyone has ever tested the habitat for this, so it may be common in a number of, the, of other taxa that show the break, and we just don't know it. Uh, this is definitely an interesting new hypothesis to test. Also, Pleistocene diversification has been downplayed in the past as a driver of North American biodiversity, but now we know that these three species, combined with the 15 other species of Lampropeltis that diversified in the Pleistocene, make up about 75% of the divergence within the genus Lampropeltis. So this definitely makes a pretty strong case for the importance of the Pleistocene in driving diversification. And finally, this leaves us with a number of questions about what's going on with this Florida divergence, something that, I, that I'm trying to address with the focus of my dissertation. So what we see in Florida is this repeated pattern of deep genetic divergence between continental and peninsular populations. You recall that this is traditionally explained by the Orange Island hypothesis, which was island refugial isolation. But when we pull a number of species on either side of this break, and you can see this in the upper left here, we get an interesting pattern. Whereas this main eastern habitat type progresses down in elevation from the Appalachian Mountains, we see the peninsular populations seem to correspond to this environmental transition and habitats associated with the southeastern coastal plain. So, again, this brings back this idea of pseudocongruence, where a plurality of causes could be behind this pattern. 
What we see then from preliminary data on divergent states is that they are all over the place as far as timing. As old as just over 6 million years and as young as, uh, as the recent 875,000 year divergence in Lampropeltis occipita lineata. But we want to test this with genomic data, right? So over the last three years, I've gone out and collected about 900 snake tissue samples from across the target area to address these questions. Locations where I've collected tissues are shown here on the left. Green is 2011, blue is 2012, and red is 2013. So I have good sampling for about 10 species pairs, and we're generating GBS SNP data for them. So now with this new SNP data we're generating, we hope to answer a number of questions, right? So which species actually show the break here at the peninsula? what the location of each of the breaks is, and do they correspond to each other? When did these groups diverge from each other? How did they diverge? What mode of speciation can we recover? We also want to test if there are any ecological factors associated with divergence, and even if any of the SNPs themselves may correspond to things that may be functional environmental traits in the genome. So it's an, definitely an interesting road ahead, maybe even transformative in how we think of the southeastern United States. But I can't think of a more fitting locale for this type of study than where phylogeography began. With that, I uh, need to uh, acknowledge a number of people uh, from my committee and current form, former lab members uh, to a large number of folks who've donated tissue samples, photos, and their valuable time and efforts helping with these projects. So this has been funded by the CUNY Graduate Center, College of Staten Island, and the American Museum of Natural History. So thank you all for listening and your attention. Um, with that, I'll take any questions.